Hello everybody. Good afternoon. Fantastic to see so many uh, many faces. Faces that are new to these Oliver family history days and faces that, um, that I've seen several times before. And on both counts, thank you for, uh, uh, for, for coming along today. An amazing, amazing story. Now we, we, we've looked at this in, in quite some detail, and there's a big article on the on the website. But yeah, for stealing four turkeys from a hen house caller, seven years transportation, and we actually know that Joshua lost his life in uh, in Bermuda. What is this man, George Oliver's remarkable World War II story? His submarine went down, was depth charged, and he was sucked out of the uh, out of the hatch uh, and up to the up to the up to the surface, and uh, was then a prisoner of war for, for several years. But yeah, the only one that survived. Sadly, I don't think we have anybody from his family line um, here today. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. So what's been happening in the last two years? Um, when I started this journey, as I say, almost 10 years ago, I didn't really know who any of these folks were. I didn't even know my grandmother's maiden name was, was Oliver. And what I've been able to conclude in the last year is putting faces to those folks within my branch of the tree, but not just them, but their partners as well. So, Personally, um, that's, uh, that's a great sense of achievement, but I guess my message is never give up hope of finding these little treasures out there. It, it might take some time. There's not always, like Linda, there's not always a, a suitcase under the, uh, under the, under the bed with, with all the treasures in there. Sometimes you have to do a bit of digging and, uh, and it's taken me some time, but I'm really pleased to have got to that point. discovered this book here, Kriege, by A.E.V. Oliver, Ollie Oliver's Remarkable World War II Story. Now I'm not going to tell you the whole story because I, I think it's a fantastic book, a fantastic story, and I would urge anybody to try and source a copy of the book. Uh, maybe we could do a book club and I'll, uh, I'll loan my copy round or something like that um, for, a, for a moderate fee. Um, Moving on, does anybody recognize this picture? <laughs> Good picture. So, coming up Carol, because there's a, there's a good story just after, last, after the last family of Oliver History Day. There's a, there's a, good, um, a good story about never giving up trying to find um, pictures of, uh, of our ancestors. 
Now we talked a lot last time around uh, uh, around Richard Barrett Oliver, but your great grandfather is Thomas Oliver, and we didn't have any pictures of him at the time. But you returned back home and you found some, didn't you? But then these are the pictures that you found. And that's Thomas Oliver and his wife Caroline Hicks. And we've been conversing for however many years. We've been put, plotting the tree together, and these pictures were out there. All but the that time. that chance kind of you know that Just chance conversation exactly. brought them to light. And now we can put Richard Barrett Oliver alongside Thomas, and these guys are brothers. Yes. Yep. Yes. Now I know that this is the third time we've met, the second time that you've travelled here for the family uh, for, for the family history stuff. And I think all I wanted to do was just note that this is a long way to travel and hugely appreciative of you and Greg taking the time to, to come all this way. But there are some other people that think you're pretty cool as well. Hi, Don and Greg. Hi. <laughs> Um, have a, a great time. We look forward to seeing you soon in Bonn. Oh, no, no, in London, in the UK. Um, lots of love from us. Yeah. And it is. Hi, mum and dad. Hi, mum and Greg. Just want to say, I hope you're having a great time at the family reunion. Yeah. Hope you're having fun over there in England. And it was nice to see you last week at the wedding. And I hope you had safe travels. We love you. I'll see you when you get back home to Australia. Bye! <laughs> and this one is pretty cool. Hello, Mama. I'm sorry I miss you, but I still love you. But I, I, love, you. I love you so much. So have fun overseas. Have fun overseas, Mama. <laughs> Mum and Dad, we hope you're having a lot of fun. We're very proud of you for all the travelling and all the um, family research you've been doing. Mum and um, looking forward to seeing it all put together. And hi to all the Olivers. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. With me. <laughs> <laughs> So, they think you're great, I think you're great, we think you're great. Thank you so much for oh, all you. of your uh, time and effort <laughs> and coming and joining these days. I think we're here, so let's, let's crack on. So this, this is our, our second slide of the day, a bit of a, a spotlight presentation, hopefully the next sort of 20 minutes. Um, kind of splits into two halves, because we all like photographs. So I'm gonna give a little bit of background, and then um, we're gonna just delve into a few, uh, a few photos. To try and paraphrase it, there was 
a, a builder um, in, the, in the village, skilled craftsman called Mr. George Howes. And he was ill um, and uh, medicine was expensive. Um, and Miriam's uh, grandparents, Prudence and Arthur, um, she talks about them being humble people, but they had knowledge of herbs and um, how you could de use these as a, as a, as a cure to make, to make you feel better. So, always willing to lend a hand, Prudence was happy to do what, whatever she could do to make, uh, make Mr. House better. So, seeing how ill the poor man was, she soon got to work making poultices and stayed all night replacing them as they cooled off. Kind of a mixture of, uh, of herbs. After a time, the treatment had worked wonders and he gradually got better and by the spring he walked down the road to see my grandmother. This is um, Miriam recalling it. To thank her for what she had done and what he could pay her. Of course, she said nothing at all, Mr. Howes. To see you about again is payment itself. Well, he said, there was one thing I would like to do and that is to take one of your boys and apprentice him to my trade on the buildings and I will make a good workman of him. Prudence thanked him and said, if you will take my Ellis, he doesn't care much for farm work, but he is a good boy. So, <coughs> Ellis took up that apprenticeship. And as we will come to learn, that was quite a defining moment in the future of the family and what the family would go on to do and the legacy that would be left around Stonesfield. I found myself in, in, in the graveyard looking down upon you know, some beautiful flowers uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the grave of, of Winifred, um, age 96. And I kicked myself a little bit because I thought, this lady's lived for 96 years, why did I start looking so late? Because this lady would know so much uh, about, this, uh, about this family tree. Um, and I was a little bit angry with myself that I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't start looking, looking earlier. But this has um, turned out to be a, a, a fascinating branch and I'm hugely thankful for the help that Caroline and Brian have, have given me over the last few days, uh, sorry, the last few months. It's been a, it's been a tough time. Um, they've lost their mother, but they've been very open and very supportive in terms of telling the family story. And, and you, don't always, you don't always get that. So, a little bit of backstory, but what we want to get to is, is some pictures, I'm sure. Move over to Ellen and Ellis. We've seen this picture and this has been shared online and this is a cracker.
Now it's been a bit of a bit of a um, a want to try and put a face to Harold. And the truth is, unfortunately, there I've not yet located any any great pictures of of Harold, apart from one in the newspaper, which gives us a a bit of a view of what he might have what he looked like. Private Harold Griffin, Canadian MCG Stonefield, killed in action. So we can put Harold with that family group. This is a picture of Ellen. This is a nice picture. Have you ever seen your dad that age? Yeah. yeah. Well, You've seen the photo? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then there's one more, which is a very significant picture. The engagement of Ellen and Alice, 1888. The little touching of, of hands there, because you couldn't really show much more affection than, than that at the time. And we'll just zoom in on them. Very handsome couple. And we'll put them with their family. So, we've been on a bit of a journey the last couple of years, learning about the family, family line. It's, um, it's been a pleasure to have learned the story, learned the significance of, of prudence in, in the story, to gather these photos together, to be able to put something like this, and, um, and it's thanks to the members of the family for, for sharing their, 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 special, their special treasures. Take it away, Jim. Right. Um, hello, everybody. It's nice to see so many Olivers. Um, I'm not one myself, I'm afraid. <laughs> Gate crushing today. Uh, the workhouse it is one of my favourite subjects, and I talk about it a lot. But today I'm going to give it, uh, excuse the terrible pun, a, an Oliver twist. <laughs> yes. Um, since Elizabethan times, um, each parish has been responsible for its own poor. Um, the wealthier inhabitants paid uh, a tax called a poor rate and that was redistributed to the needier residents. Um, they were often small parish workhouses but they were just converted cottages usually, nothing big. Um, and many poor people were given relief in the form of um, money or food or clothes um, without having to go into the workhouse. That was called outdoor relief as opposed to in the workhouse relief. Um, was that the old parish workhouses were just too small because the workhouse now had to take in all the paupers from that whole district. Um, so they had to start building new big workhouse buildings. Um, these were some of the suggested designs. Um, and in fact the ones built in this area were quite similar to these. Um, and, all the, and these are very like prison, a prison design called the Panopticon, where there's a central viewing tower where you could look down into, the master could look down into all the yards and see what the paupers are getting up to.
There are a couple called Robert and Susanna Oliver from Stonesfield, and their daughter Harriet married a Charles Somerton in 1860. Um, they went off to Banbury, where Charles had various jobs, porter, baker, grocer, uh, but once their children were grown up, they obviously looked for a different kind of work, and we find them in, on the 1891 census in the workhouse in Christchurch, Hampshire, not as inmates, um, but with Charles as the porter and Harriet as a general assistant. And by 1901, they had moved onwards and upwards, Ringwood Workhouse, um, where they had risen to being master and matron. Um, and their daughter Clara worked there as well as a nurse, so it was quite a family concern. Um, she, all three resigned though in 1906 and came back to Oxfordshire. Um, so on the 1911 census, Charles and Harriet are old age pensioners, which was quite a new innovation by then. Um, and their daughter um, was now working at Banbury Workhouse. The children were born in the workhouse, um, and especially illegitimate children. Um, and I've got two certificates coming up, which Linda has supplied, thank you Linda, um, for children of Mary Oliver, um, I think was living in Finstock then, is that right? Yes, which would be in the, so that's the catchment area for Chipping Norton. So off she goes into to the Chipping Norton workhouse to have her babies. This is Augustus, born in 1855. The usual blank where the father's name and occupation would be. And then again, two years later, Mary Ann Margaret Oliver born in Chipping Norton Workhouse. Um, and I think maybe still the words workhouse are sort of rather chilling and I hope nobody ever brings them back again. Um, right, that was my bridge diversion. <laughs> <laughs>